For more information about this or any episode of the podcast, check out the website at philosophizethis.org. We have additional content, further reading, transcripts of every show, all free, of course. But if you value the show as an educational resource and you want to help keep it going, you can find out more about how to do that at patreon.com slash philosophize this. Or alternatively, if you're buying something from Amazon this week anyway, consider clicking through our banner. It's at the bottom center of the landing page of philosophizethis.org. Small percentage goes back to the show. It may just be a click for you, but every little bit adds up. Thank you for wanting to know more today than you did yesterday, and I hope you love the show. Want to begin the episode today with a little thought experiment. I want you to imagine that something happens to society as we currently know it. You know, there's a downfall of the standing government of whatever country you're currently living in. And all of a sudden, you find out that the new system of government that's going to be erected is a monarchy. Now, as modern citizens of democratic societies, we're supposed to be appalled by the idea of this ever happening. I mean, we saw what happened in World War II, right? We saw what happened categorically throughout human history. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. This monarchy's never going to work. Why even talk about it? It doesn't matter who the monarch is, it's destined to fail. Well, hold on, let's just say that we had to for a second. What sort of qualities would you want that monarch ruler to have, if you had to be ruled by one? What sort of personality traits would you want him to have? In fact, let's take it one step further and go a little bit ridiculous here. What would that monarch ruler's spirit animal be? <laughs> what animal from the animal kingdom possesses the sorts of qualities that you would want in a monarch ruler if you had to live under one? Now, Machiavelli gave us a couple. Would you want him to be cunning and sneaky like a fox? You know, to be able to always be one step ahead of other rulers? Or would you want him to be more like a lion? You know, strong, brave, king of the jungle, keeping us safe from everything that might potentially harm us. Maybe you want him to be like one of those weird angler fish that live at the bottom of the ocean, you know, with the lantern on their head, guiding us through the dark, uncharted waters ahead. Well, in the 1600s, a man named Thomas Hobbes asked himself that very same question, and the animal that he chose when he asked it was a leviathan. Now, for anybody unfamiliar, the leviathan is an animal from mythology. It doesn't actually exist. It's known as being monstrous and terrifying, kind of like the alpha predator of the ocean. But look, you don't got to take my word for it. You can read exactly what Thomas Hobbes read in the Bible, in Job 41.18, quote, His sneezings flash forth light, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. It says later in the Bible, Smoke went up from his nostrils, and devouring fire from his mouth, glowing coals flamed forth from him. It says in Revelation later, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. End quote. Now to me personally, I think this sounds terrifying. I mean, seriously, what world has this creature lived in where natural selection has allowed for it to have ten horns? Like, in what world do you benefit from fighting ten things simultaneously? But really, it's not important what I think of this thing. It's what Thomas Hobbes thought of this thing. These are the descriptions he was reading when he was racking his brain for the thing that he wants his leader to be most like. I mean, of all the creatures you could choose, you choose a leviathan? That doesn't sound very fun. Well, he was speaking metaphorically. He needed to go to mythology to even find a creature to compare his vision to. Now, the title of his most famous work was Leviathan, and he actually helped design the front cover of the first printing of his book. And what he chose for the cover was a giant human-shaped figure, its body made out of hundreds of small human bodies representing the citizens of a potential state. And the head of this giant human figure was one man, what he referred to as the Sovereign. But before we dive into Leviathan, it's going to be useful for us to understand where Thomas Hobbes is coming from with all of this. Let's get a little background on him. Thomas Hobbes was born in 1588 and was very quickly after his birth made an orphan. Now shortly after that, his uncle, who happened to be quite well off, quite rich, agreed to take care of him. 
and that's significant to us because without his uncle as his guardian, Thomas Hobbes may not have ever had the resources to acquire the education that allowed him to then go on and affect generation after generation of future philosophers, which you'll soon learn about. But the other important part of Hobbes's life is that he lived smack dab in the middle of the English Civil War that took place in the 1640s. So he was uniquely aware of just how easily the bricks that hold society together can come crumbling down. Now this fact also offers us some insight into the world Hobbes was immersed in, and how that world may have shaded his views on human beings in general, or the inevitabilities of any political system that he saw. But moving on, maybe some of us have heard the term social contract before. Well, what is a social contract? Well, we can get some insight into that by thinking about what a contract is at all. The dictionary defines contract as a written or spoken agreement, usually by two or more parties. Well, the social contract that we're going to talk about today is one of several social contracts that will eventually be laid out by philosophers, and what it concerns itself with at its core are two fundamental questions. One, why do humans need government in the first place? Or how did people come to realize that government was a good idea at all? And two, what is the role of government in the lives of the individual citizens? Or how much authority should that government have? Now the social contract is something you're very familiar with, because whether you realize it or not, you have signed it and live in accordance with it every single day ever since that, that fateful day at the hospital when your mother gave birth to you. But to be fair to you, it really wasn't an explicit choice that you made at first. The choice was made for you by thousands of years of human civilization, but to be fair to them, in the eyes of Thomas Hobbes, it was, without a doubt, the correct choice, and you should really be thanking them for it. Let's talk about why. Thomas Hobbes says that in the beginning, man lived in what he called a state of nature. Now, in modern times, nature typically comes with a pretty positive connotation. You know, let's go on a nature walk. You want to come? That sounds pretty peaceful. You wouldn't want to come on the Thomas Hobbes nature walk. The state of nature to Thomas Hobbes is a ruthless, dog-eat-dog, perpetual state of warfare where anything goes and any act of violence is justifiable, no matter how seemingly unnecessary it is. This sort of world is the default state of man when no laws and government are in place to maintain order. Maybe the best way to picture the state of nature that Thomas Hobbes described is to think about what it might look like in modern times if it was instantly implemented. I mean, what would happen if all of a sudden laws and government cease to exist? What would the world look like? Well, luckily for us, it's laid out perfectly in the movie The Purge that came out a couple years ago. In fact, I think there's a sequel coming out this year. If anybody hasn't seen it, the premise of the movie is that, well, for various reasons that supposedly benefit society in the movie, the tagline of the movie trailer is that all crime, including murder, is legal for 12 hours. And then once that 12 hours is up, it's over, you can be punished again. I still have no idea why they needed to make the distinction that all crime, including murder, I'm pretty sure that's included in all crime. But anyway, this 12-hour period in this movie is a great depiction of what the state of nature would look like to Thomas Hobbes. There are no private property laws. People are taking whatever they want. They're trespassing wherever they want, killing whoever they want if it benefits them in some way. There are no police to come to your home if someone attacks you. There are no fire trucks to come if your house is set on fire. There's no FBI to track down your kids if they're kidnapped. Thomas Hobbes paints a very similar picture when describing the state of nature. He says that because there is no private property, nothing belongs to anyone. Now the thing about that is that it's not like when that happens, when there's no private property, we don't instantly enter a society where everything's of communal property. No, the inverse is true as well, that everything belongs to everybody. And this sort of dynamic makes everything constantly up for grabs. This sort of dynamic also makes you perpetually at war with the rest of the potential grabbers, which is everything that exists on planet Earth. Hobbes describes the state of nature here, quote, 
In such condition there is no place for industry, because the fruit thereof is uncertain, and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation, nor use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving or removing such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear, in danger of violent death, and the life of man solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. End quote. Not only are you constantly at war with things like starvation, or the elements, or not to mention any renegade asteroids that might want to come down and just instantly end your existence, but you are at war with every single other human on planet Earth. You're living a subsistent lifestyle. You have nobody to trade with. There is no specialization. Your life becomes very similar to an animal's life, looking for food and other necessities of survival, constantly paranoid of predators watching you, living a solitary, brutish life, as Hobbes would say. Things are not very fun. And the reason you'd have to be paranoid and just expect people to undermine your survival in the name of theirs is that morality, as we know it, does not exist in the state of nature that Hobbes lays out. He explains it here in the Leviathan, extrapolating from the inevitable state of war that we find ourselves in when we're in that state of nature. Quote, to this war of every man against every man, this is also consequent, that nothing can be unjust. The notions of right and wrong, justice and injustice, have there no place. Where there is no common power, there is no law. Where no law, no injustice. Force and fraud are in war the two cardinal virtues. Justice and injustice are none of the faculties neither of the body nor mind. If they were, they might be in a man that were alone in the world as well as his senses and passions. They are qualities that relate to men in society, not in solitude." End quote. What he's saying here is, if you were living this terrifying, subsistent lifestyle in the state of nature, when somebody sneaks up behind you and they, they beat you in the head with a rock, they steal your wife from you, they kill all your children and take all of your stuff, all of that before you even regain consciousness, you might feel kind of irritated at that guy, right? I mean, in today's world, that's a pretty messed up thing to do. Totally unfair, right? Wrong. Thomas Hobbes says that there is no injustice when no laws are put in place in the first place. Whether something is good or bad or right or wrong really is only present when there's a goal that's trying to be achieved. People living in the state of nature don't have a system of laws that they can look to and feel a sense of injustice about. In the state of nature, there is no good or bad behavior as we would typically see it. In fact, the only thing that can really be considered a good in the state of nature, the single goal that is in place for humans when in this state of nature, is self-preservation. Self-preservation is the goal, therefore, in every action that we take while in this state of nature, we should strive for it. Let's say you come across somebody else's camp, He's gone somewhere, so you take all of his food, all of his supplies, all of his materials. That's perfectly justifiable because you're acting in the interest of the only good, which is self-preservation. And to Thomas Hobbes, this is both obvious and understandable. This is perfectly compatible with his view of what human nature is, to be selfish. We are self-interested, survival-oriented machines to Thomas Hobbes. We have deep impulses, deep inside of us, to slight each other in the name of self-preservation. By far, this is the biggest point of disagreement with Thomas Hobbes by future philosophers. Are all humans at their roots fundamentally selfish? It's a tough question, and it's not weird if you feel attacked when he says that. It's not weird if you disagree with it. I mean, after all, how does Hobbes explain someone who volunteers their time? How does Hobbes explain somebody that performs good deeds, like helping an old lady across the street? Certainly these people who are altruistic aren't selfishly driven at their core, are they? Well, there are good arguments on either side. Hobbes would probably respond to that, that people who are altruistic do so because of their selfish drive to assert themselves as superior to other people. Morally superior to those who could have helped the old lady across the street, but chose not to, 
and physically superior to the old woman he's helping across the street. Now, when you start to get into the intentions as to why people do what they do, things can get a little hazy. The important part is that Hobbes views human nature as fundamentally selfish, and he's perfectly fine with that. In fact, if you're one of those people that think that deep down people are good at their core and not selfish, Hobbes would say, why do you lock your door at night then? I mean, if that's truly what you believe, that humans are good and not selfish, then leave your door unlocked. You shouldn't be scared of that. One of the things that makes Hobbes really unique about this time period is that 